welcome to Moments with Melinda, and I am your host, Melinda Moulton. And today, I am so thrilled to have as my guest, Catherine Monstream. Catherine, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Thank you, Melinda. I'm so happy to be here. Always a pleasure to speak with you, see you any, any way I can get you. I know. We just had the opportunity to see each other a few, other, a few days ago, and it was wonderful. I always love seeing you. Well, we've known each other for a very, very long time. I mean, back in the early days uh, at Main Street Landing in Union Station, when you came into my office to rent a studio, you want to talk a little bit about that day and when that was? Yeah, I, I was probably like 25 years old, and I I heard there were some some studio spaces in this old train station, so I like wandered down. It was kind of like a little bit derelict then, and there were like wires to trip over in the <laughs> in the lobby, and I was sort of like, "Ooh, this looks interesting." And then I went upstairs. I found you, and I was like, "Hey, can I can I maybe rent a space here?" And you're like, "Sure." And we just had this right away hit it off and um that was before kids be probably before dogs and uh over the years I think I spent 26 years at Union Station you did and, uh, lots of transitions now I think now I think I actually think when was in Charlotte I, I think that you might have had Charlotte in a snuggly I and think I, that came I think years work, could you have, I mean she, I, cause I just, I just, uh, I just remember you having sure, but anyway, now she's all grown up and she's an artist herself and yes. that's a whole nother story. I'll have to interview her at some point, but, yeah. um, so let's talk a little bit about your early childhood. Cause a lot of people in Vermont know you, you're very well known. You're very highly respected. Your art is, is so beautiful. And, but a lot of people don't know about you, Catherine Monstream. So where do you hail from and tell us a little bit about your childhood? <laughs> I grew up in a sleepy town um, in central Connecticut, right outside of Hartford on the Connecticut River, uh, Weathersfield, Connecticut, and had, you know, a pretty lovely childhood. M amazing parents are so supportive, uh, brother and sister. Um, I was not a good student. I really struggled in school and think I'm so grateful my parents noticed that, but they noticed I, I loved to draw and paint and they were really good. They immediately got me into like amazing art classes at the Wadsworth Athenaeum and plain air with my art teacher in the summer. So I feel like I landed in a really good place, even though school was like, could have gone worse for me. And, but thank God I had my folks that were like, we got you. So that was lucky. Well, you do have an extraordinary family. Both your parents are still alive and I've met them and, and they're just remarkable human beings as are your siblings. Um, so your parents recognized that you had this gift and they encouraged you. So who, who was your greatest inspiration as a child? Who, who inspired you the most in your life? Or maybe there's a few. I mean, probably my art teacher, Miss Pescatello. She was like total hippie with her little Volkswagen Beetle and wore big stacked, you know, 1960s, uh, those big stacked shoes and her hair was all tousled and I just thought she was like such a superstar and my she was my art teacher for years and uh and really taught me to to go outside the box and paint outside and also how to do contour drawing which is when you you look at the object and you study it and you have to look and look you can't just guess the line and that was like really really good stuff so I I always wish I could find her and I haven't been able to but she was amazing you have not been able to connect with her. No, she, I think she dropped her last name. And so then it's hard to find people. Oh my heavens, but she should find you. You can, well, you did, you did keep your maiden name. So maybe someday she'll find you. If, maybe. And I remember those days because I could have been that hippie that, because I was that hippie with the, and they were called platform shoes. That's platforms, yes. Literally. Yes. And a lot of us, and a lot of us broke our ankles back then because of those platform shoes. <laughs> I, I once went up, went up for a layup and playing basketball with Rick's brother and came down and broke my ankle. But anyway, that's another story. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your art um, and uh, and the medium. Uh, you 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 primarily use our watercolorist, which is extremely difficult painting, and you've done some oil. Talk to us about what the inspiration is for your work and what moves you. And what and, and and what you see in your mind when you move for to, to do some new projects? Mm, right. Um, I think I'm always looking for the next thing that kind of hits you over the head, where you're just like, "What? This is amazing!" And 
early years was the train station and the train yard. And I did some pretty gritty paintings down, got permission to be in the train yard and did a bunch of watercolors there. Uh, later, more industrial was the Moran plant. I've also done projects on African dance, um, swimming holes. So you're kind of always looking for a theme that you can kind of really dig your, dig your nails into. And uh, the watercolors for me are just so familiar. I've, I've got so much time into learning that craft that I know they're hard, but I feel like I kind of understand what they're going to do. And I had a great teacher, Larry Goldsmith, who really taught me to paint wet on wet, just start wet, let it go and not panic. And, and that takes some time to kind of be able to be brave and go, okay, here we go. This thing is gonna take off on me. Um, oils uh, have such a different feel to me because of the scale and this viscosity and there's no glass. So I also love oil painting, um, but for different reasons. And I kind of go through stages where I'm really practiced in one or the other. And then when I switch back, I'm a little, I'm always surprised I get a little rusty. I wouldn't think I would, but I do. So I'm always looking for like the next subject that will just kind of really push me in a new direction. So what's your subject now? What is your subject that you're working on now? What is, well, what's motivating you? The pandemic really kind of, um, kind of put me in a place to paint really. Uh, I thought I was gonna do all this new exploration, but what I'm finding I keep doing is sunsets. It's just like, I keep looking for the beauty cause it's calming. And so I feel like I've really done many, many, many sunsets and just sort of more beautiful vistas that kind of take me to a place that's calm and that in a world that's sort of in a pretty uncomfortable place day to day for many reasons, I think that has been really helpful. It's kind of therapeutic to paint these brilliant, you know, colors of skies and just letting them melt together. It's just like, okay, uh, I can do this. You know? so, it's, so it's painting as therapy for you in the same way that music is for some people. Yeah, I would say that's true because you can get lost in it, you know, to try to find that place where you forget about what time it is and you're just in that zone. It's kind of hard to get there sometimes, but if I can get to that zone, it's just really, uh, it, it's a restart and it's, it's good. Well, that's what art does for humanity. Yeah. Whether it's whether it's theater, or performing arts, or the visual arts, or music, or poetry, or writing, mm -hmm. it does take you to another place. And art is what defines civilization. So let's talk a little bit about that. A lot of artists um, aren't aren't able to promote their work and actually make a living as an artist. And you have managed to do that in spades. And so I'd love for you to share a little bit with my viewers um, how you did that and. Um, and uh, and and what sustains you in being able to create this incredible business that's nationwide to right. take your work and your art, which heals you, and put it out there to the world and actually make a living? Because not every not every artist can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I feel like I have been extraordinarily fortunate, and part of that is just my family always being so supportive. But I think um, I, there's one part of it that doesn't have anything to do with me or my work, and that is. Who's to say which artist's work is so, uh, one person said digestible, that they wanna own it. And, I, and that's kind of unfair. Like there's some incredibly talented people out there, but whether people pull out their checkbook or their Venmo, I, that's a whole nother thing. And for some reason, I don't know why, my work is something that people have wanted to own. And that's been just, I think that's pure luck in a lot of way that what I paint happens to be desirable and it's it's not about talent it's just they're just interested in it and they want to have it so i feel like i i reach a lot of people that way and that's not something i really tried to do it just happens but then once i understood that people responded well i think i am good at, at reminding people that i'm here and we you know use our social media platforms and have openings and try to really make it and then with our greeting card company I mean, the greeting card company is wonderful because it's like mass marketing. You're sending out thousands of cards to stores where people can flip it over and go, oh, I wanna see more of her work. So that part is again, sort of lucky that we've been able to sustain a greeting card company. That's not something that I would necessarily recommend because it takes incredible amount of time. Luckily, I have a husband who loves that job and that's his. Uh, if tomorrow we said, I don't wanna ship cards anymore i would just be like just sell them on the rack i'm not i wouldn't try to keep that that part of the business going but it's a great marketing tool so we've been lucky that way too um 
being able to talk to people is, is really, uh, not everybody can do that. Some people are really shy and it's hard to uh, communicate. So I feel like I'm lucky. I have a background in, which I don't share very often, real estate. For a little while, I sold real estate. And I think that was so hard to like, have to open yourself up to people. Um, and I think that really helped me be like braver about talking to new people. Well, you, you do put yourself out there and you do it beautifully. Um, and Alan, uh, years ago, took on the, the greeting card business and you have your annual sale where you sell it. But the other thing about your work, and I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna say this and I'm not being patronizing, you paint beautiful images that people relate to. People can relate to your work, whether it's my, my looking at a painting of yours of Camel's Hump, of the mountain that I look at every morning, and the way that you capture it and the colors that you capture. You have a way of taking the beauty or natural beauty or whatever you're painting, and you make it relatable to people. And that is a talent. That's a gift. And not everybody has that. Um, but you have your show that you do. You have your studio. You have your card business. And the other thing about your work is it's affordable. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the $50,000 painting. I mean, it, you, you, you make your work um, available to, to everyone. And talk a little bit about that. Well, that's, and that's partly because I, as much as I always wished that uh, I would be having shows in New York City by now and have paintings for $50,000, that's just not how it went. It, I, I just feel like, my local patrons and the local folks have been so supportive of our business and of my work for so long. I never would have imagined that. And even during the beginning of the pandemic, I thought, wow, make a list of everything that you need in your life right now. And it's like, I'm last. You don't need art. And yet people came out in droves and were like, I'm going to support the arts. I'm not going on vacation. I'm going to buy, I'm sick of the painting over my couch. So I was really, I feel like I've been around in this business long enough that people not only like the work, but they're happy to support our family. And I feel like that's a little piece of it too, which is really nice. Um, I, I never had really any intention of being an artist or thinking about whether it's affordable or not. It's just, I'm sort of more like, okay, this is working this week, let's keep going. And it wasn't ever like, it's not like a big business model or anything. It's just where it is. Um, the prices do go up, but not that much. Well, you're a here be now person and you live in the now, which is a which is a wonderful quality. But at the end of the day, I do believe if you wanted to have an exhibit in New York that you could if you wanted to. And if you wanted to structure your life and your work in the way that your paintings were beyond the reach of most people and only hanging in the in the homes of the rich, um, mm -hmm. that that wouldn't appeal to you, that you want people to be able to share your art. Yeah, and do that. And that's a loving, caring, sharing uh, way that you are. And so for that. Um, you should embrace that. And I know you're honored for it. Um, do you believe that, that art is what defines civilization? Because I, I believe that. But do you, do you get that? I, I, don't, I don't think I could, could agree. And not because I don't agree, because I haven't really thought about it very much. Um, that's, that's, a, that's, a big, that's a big one. And uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to put that in. Would you want to know mind. why? Do why? You know yes. why? Yeah, tell me. Because... Um, because whenever you go back in time, years and years and years ago, whether it's what's been painted on the inside of caves tens of thousands of years ago, or what you find in the chips of pottery that you find in the ground, that is what that is how we today define what that civilization was. Right. And it's always the art. It's yeah, that is interesting. It is one of the things that they say that long after you're gone that actually has the most ability to last you know your clothes won't your um your furniture won't last the books you purchase maybe maybe not but art is something that people if if they like it will hang on to for possibly generations and that's pretty interesting to me um that to, the thought of that is kind of like oh that's kind of cool well, and not just me but like in like in civilization and great artists of like Monet or whoever, Van Gogh, like you do look back and go, wow, these things have lasted. And they tell the story of that time. That time. So I always say art is what defines it. But anyway, hmm. let's talk about Vermont. Now you, you're, you're a Connecticut lady. So why Vermont? What is it that makes you love this state? Uh, what brought you here? What keeps you here? 
Um, share a little bit about that. I mean, I, I knew from the time I was six or seven that I wanted to live in Vermont because growing up in, in Connecticut, it's, it's uh, flat, it's hot, it's hot here too. Uh, there's no large bodies of water except for like the Long Island Sound and a few reservoirs. Um, there's a lot of billboards. There was this huge influx of high lies. So it was a huge bedding area, like lots of, it just wasn't, it didn't feel like me and my people or, so I always knew when I came to Vermont to ski, my dad got me skiing really early. I was just like, yeah, this is where I wanna be. And it never went away. Even in high school, every Sunday afternoon, we pack up the station wagon and drive south back to Hartford. Wow, oh, it was so depressing. I don't, I love my family and my home there, but I just didn't feel like it was really my, my place. I always wanted to be in Vermont. So as soon as I was 18, I went to Green Mountain College for two years and then went out to see Boulder for my last two years. And, um, but I just knew I wanted to be in Vermont. So I just basically was reading about Bernie Sanders and I was like, those are my people. I'm moving there. I, so I moved here very after I didn't get into UVM twice, not once, twice, I was like, I'm living there. Even if I didn't get into the university, they can't stop me. And so I really never looked back. It's perfect for me. Well, you would so get into UVM today and you should get an honor honorable diploma from UVM <laughs> because you certainly deserve it. So I'm putting that right out to my viewers. I do want to, I do want to send my viewers to your website. Uh, go to kmmstudio dot com is that right yeah that's right ammstudio.com and you can look at all of Catherine monstream's work you can learn about her life it's a lovely website um well i'm glad you came to vermont um i think you've made vermont a a, a better place to be here and you've definitely made um made a lot of change happen here so let's talk about a little bit of our the state of our world um uh, how can art transform society? Because I know back in my generation, we had a lot of music and art and a lot of, um, I just learned about the Fuzzas movement. I don't know, I mean, I'm pronouncing it right, but John Clackey shared with me a story he wrote about a couple of artists who started the, the, the art movement where um, they, the art transforms itself right in front of the viewer. But anyway, how do you feel art is transforming our society today to help fight some of the issues and challenges that we're facing today? Right. Um, again, for, well, for me, it's, it's, it's so much more just visceral about me, my brain, and then the paint. So it's, I don't always get involved as much in thinking about like the bigger picture of what it brings to people or society. So I, but I certainly think the, the thing it can do is bring joy and distraction from a really hard, hard news that we're having day after day that's also highly, highly stressful for everyone. Even if you live in a beautiful place like Vermont, you read about the Ukraine, you read about Washington, D.C., you read about another school shooting. It's like it, it's so painful. So I don't I don't know how we can really get so much transformation through art, but I think the, the people people that are doing beautiful things or not even beautiful, but are doing really poignant pieces, whether it's performance or, or other, I think it's really um, important that that continues to happen. Um, my role there, I don't know, other than just, uh, I would say, joy and and distraction are the two things that come to mind. And beauty, but Catherine, you are, you, you do speak up and you do paint uh, for things that you believe in. And one of those was the Moran plant, right. the, the renovation. You were very, very involved. And when you get when you get into something, your paint will reflect that. I even think that the chili dippers, which I want you to talk about, is a form, is an art form. And the yeah. visuals that are out there of these incredible women, yeah. these powerful, courageous women, that's an art form. That is performance art. And yeah. we all watch the videos and we look at the women and they're all yeah. beautiful, yeah. all different shapes and sizes and yeah. jumping in the water when it's 20 below zero. And that is performance art. So I do think that you yeah. have a message um, that you do. So let's talk a little bit um, about the Chili Dippers and about how that all came about. Right. Um yeah, I never thought it would be something I would do, but I have one friend named Elise, who's just an amazing inspiration to me. And she had been doing it every month without missing a month for 12 years. 
filled years, like never missed a month. And, and I just was like, like so uh, inspired by that. And I didn't really want to do it, but I did. So finally she would invite me. And finally, after maybe like a year's worth of emails, I was like, it was December. And I was like, I'm just, I just have to go do this. I'm going to go. And, you know, once I did it once, you know, it, it was, it just takes so much courage and, and to walk into this like icy water. It's just like, I loved how brave I, and how proud of myself I was. So that really like kind of fueled this really amazing positivity that I felt for a long time. So once I did it once, I was like, oh, I want to go again. And then I started doing it regularly. And then the pandemic started. And then I was getting texts. When are you going again? When are you, people were desperate to be near each other outside and to do something that would just like take them out of their head that was nearby, you didn't have to travel. And I think that sort of started it. And at that point I was like, wow, a lot of people really want to do this. I need to come up with a name. So I had all these dorky names like Ladies of the Lake, no. The Seal Club, no. So my uh, youngest daughter came up with, the, she's like, mom, the Red Hot Chili Dippers. I was like, okay, done, it's perfect. And uh, it just kind of grew from there, but mostly from the Instagram page, people would see the pictures and then, say how can I join you when are you going again and it was really surprising how many people and still to this day like are asking all the time uh it's really a revolution that I didn't obviously I didn't start it but um it's what you did you well, did well you did you did start the you did start the revolution and you have to take credit for that you are one of the most um humble beautiful women I know and I love your humility but you did you did start a big movement talk to us about the benefits of cold water because I did do the penguin plunge for special olympics yeah because of my age um I you know it's not something that I can do regularly because because of my heart but um when I got in that freezing cold water it the water was almost hot it felt hot to my body. It was amazing. And it wasn't amazing. And when I came out, Rick said to me, you look 20 years younger. I was so flushed and beautiful. He said, oh my God, you look 20 years younger. Talk to us a little bit about the health benefits and how people can get involved. Sure. Um, I mean, for me, it's, these are things that I, I don't, I don't really know. Wim Hof is the Dutch man who really has revolutionized this whole thing. And, you know, at least in the current time. And so he talks about um, it builds your immune system because you're, you're stressing your immune system. And so that you should get, you know, possibly less ill and less, less viruses. Um, for me, mental health, like it, people use it for depression and just using it to just like, absolutely, once you step into that water, whatever narrative is playing in your head or whatever stories are going on that are sort of plaguing you or worries, they go because you're at that point, you just have to your body's like, oh, we have to survive this. This is life threatening. So everything, that's the part I love is you just come out and you're just like, oh, it's just like, you can just start fresh. And so I think to me, that is always so, um, I look forward to that feeling, even though I don't, people think I love the cold water. I don't love it. I love what it does for me. There you go. Um, circulation, better circulation, inflammation, it lowers, you know, there's all kinds of uh, testimonials about what it's done for people and amazing like letters that people have said, you have no idea, you will never know how much you've done for me. And it's been really interesting to, to hear those and, and feel them. It's like, wow. Um, if people want to get involved, I, I have a nimble small group that goes every day all winter, but then we do a larger open dips, which are maybe once a week. And so there's an email chain that I will say, because I have to watch the weather. It's not, like I can say every Wednesday at four, because if the wind is blowing really hard or it's too cold, or even the path down to it is just like glossy ice because the day before was waves, you just have to um, kind of do it a 24 hour ahead of time because it is dangerous. I mean, I have to remind myself it's it's not for everybody and I, I don't want anyone to get hurt. Or well, there you go and you have to think about that. But I love seeing, you know, even down here in, in, in Huntington, seeing the women sitting down by the Huntington River in the middle of February and they have the ice flows around them and they're sitting there and the big smiles. Yeah, so yeah. I'm glad that you're saying that you understand, you know, that it is challenging and it is, there is a level of danger, but you, uh, but um, it also is a wonderful movement that you've started and it's helping people. And, um, and I congratulate you on that. So we have a few more minutes, Catherine, and I'd love to talk to you uh, briefly about, um, 
your wisdom for today's youth um, in how to face the world that they're facing. I know you have three children, uh, you know, tour just at that fabulous 200 mile bike ride uh, for reproductive access. And I know Charlotte is involved too in, in helping to change the world as is um, your younger daughter, Bear. So share with us a little bit about your wisdom for today's youth, because I'm sure you share that with your own children. Yeah, I mean, I think mostly we try to set by, you know, set good examples of saying like the, these are important uh, topics that you need to vote and, and show them that you vote and you need to like find joy in your life. What is your passion? Is it riding your bike? Is it climbing, um, whatever, just helping them find things that where they can also get out of their own head because there's so much to worry about for, especially I think for our youth with Roe versus Wade being overturned and you know just so many things like the war. I mean, it, it just goes on and on and then just fear of going to school. Um, I really ache for, I think these, these younger people that have to kind of navigate so much. So I think finding, finding um, your joy and, and to be able to find that and, and use it and also be an activist. You know, there's nothing wrong with like speaking up or, or donating or however you can do something to work on climate change or whatever your passion is. I think that those are very satisfying things to do. And, um, and, and then lastly, find your people. There is, there's, no matter what your, your stick is, there's people out there like you that will understand you. And I think that's really important because we can definitely feel isolated if we're a little different or if, you know, friends aren't being kind and you need to like find the people that do understand you and surround yourself with people that uh, will share that love for your passions and also support. That's, that's a great, that's such a beautiful message, Catherine. Thank you. And just, that's exactly, I mean, that's just such a beautiful message. And um and thank you for that. Well, we're coming to the end of our interview and I'm gonna ask you to stay on after I stop the recording, but um, I have just, I mean, basically we've grown up together. You've yeah. grown up from your twenties into your fifties and I grew from my thirties into my seventies. And, um, and I've always considered you uh, just a bright light in my life and certainly the life of most Vermonters. And um, it's such a privilege to hear about your life and to hear about you and your work. And thank you for giving me this time. It's my pleasure. I always love hearing what you're up to and seeing you. And I hope to see you more now that you're not working as much. I hope I get to get my hands around you a little more. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe I'll show up at one of these chili dippers and just get myself in there. All right. Well, listen. And to my viewers, I want to thank you for joining us today. And I will see you again soon with another moment with Melinda. Thank you and goodbye.